Tired of ads barging into your favorite news podcasts? Good news. Ad-free listening on Amazon Music is included with your Prime membership. Just head to amazon.com slash ad-free news podcasts to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Enjoy thousands of ACAST shows ad-free for Prime subscribers. Some shows may have ads. It's Wednesday the 27th of December. I'm Jamie East and this is a look back at May and June of 2023, including Britain getting a new king, Boris quitting in a huff, unwise but not illegal entering the chat and Liverpool starring in the Eurovision. Grab a cup of something hot, put up your feet and get up to speed on the seven biggest stories of the week. This is the standout seven from the Smart Seven. It's news, but not the news. Charles Philip Arthur George Windsor was finally crowned king on Saturday the 6th of May at the ripe old age of 74. He and Queen Camilla had a lavish ceremony at Westminster Abbey in front of 2,000 guests, complete with gold coach and a mid-ceremony costume change. It all culminated with King Charles III making his solemn vows. I, Charles, do solemnly and sincerely, in the presence of God, profess that I am a faithful Protestant, and that I will uphold and maintain the said enactments to the best of my powers according to law. Sunday saw a big lunch take place across the UK with Rishi Sunak and Jill Biden hosting a street party on Downing Street. There were accusations of heavy-handed policing too, with protesters arrested and detained, including volunteers who were handing out rape alarms. Sunday night finished off with a coronation concert from Windsor Castle with Lionel Richie, Katy Perry, Take That and a speech from Prince William. Oh, and you can find our Smarter 7 special on King Charles III, The Rocky Road to Reigning, wherever you get your podcasts. As my grandmother said when she was crowned, coronations are a declaration of our hopes for the future. And I know she's up there fondly keeping an eye on us. And she'd be a very proud mother. Monday was the final day of coronation celebrations and the public was invited to spend their bank holiday volunteering as part of the big help out. Rishi had his sleeves rolled up and was busy making sandwiches in a Hertfordshire community hall. While he was there, he addressed the backlash over arrests of peaceful protesters at Saturday's coronation, although he didn't seem too concerned. Actually, I'm grateful to the police and everyone who played a part in ensuring that this weekend has gone so well, so successfully and so safely. That was an extraordinary effort by so many people and I'm grateful to them for all their hard work. The Met Police made 64 arrests and Graham Smith, CEO of anti-monarchy campaign group Republic, was one of them and he was surprised how events unfolded. We turned up to peacefully protest. We'd had four months of conversations with the police. We turned up and we were immediately surrounded by large numbers of police officers who uh, detained us and then arrested us and kept us in police station for 16 hours without any cause whatsoever. Dal Babu, former chief superintendent with the Met Police, says the weekend's events did little to improve public perception of the police. Trust has never been lower in, in the police. There's a huge problem with trust in the police and uh, a lot of this will be uh, people saying that we don't trust the police. So the police have got to work very, very hard to win, win back that trust. Friday the 9th of June saw former Prime Minister Boris Johnson dramatically resign with a 1,000-word statement attacking the government and Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Two of his allies quit with him, Nadine Doris and Selby MP Nigel Adams. It was a preemptive move to try and get ahead of the Partygate report, which he was busy describing as a witch hunt by a kangaroo court, having seen an early copy. Former Number 10 Communications Director Guto Harry says Boris jumped to avoid being pushed. This weekend of a situation that was out of his control and drifting you know, inevitably towards a very, very unhappy and undignified sort of conclusion. But the controversy didn't end there. When Boris's resignation honours list was published, there were several anticipated names missing, including Alok Sharma, Nigel and Nadine. Boris claimed Rishi had edited the list, but the Prime Minister himself said the shaggy blonde millionaire had asked him to overrule the panel who vetted the appointment list. Boris Johnson asked me to do something that I wasn't prepared to do. That was to you know, either overrule the HOLAC committee or to make promises with people. I wasn't prepared to do that. As I said, I didn't think it was right. And if people don't like that, then tough. It took until Thursday of next week for the full Partygate report to be released, and it was truly damning for Boris. The 30,000 words found the former PM did mislead Parliament over lockdown partying and that he was complicit in an intimidation campaign against the committee investigating him. It would have been enough to see him suspended from Parliament for 90 days, automatically triggering a by-election. 
Reaction to the findings was mixed. Labour Deputy Angela Rayner felt that Boris should have just come forward and apologised. Boris Johnson is not only a lawbreaker but a liar. He's not fit for public office and he's disgraced himself and continues to act like a you know, pound shot Trump in the way in which he tries to discredit anybody who criticises his actions. But Boris still had some supporters left. Former Brexit Minister Jacob Rees-Mogg was quick to come to his best bud's defence. I think their fundamental judgment is wrong because I don't think he deliberately met Mr led Parliament, but I think the 90-day sanction shows more than perhaps the committee would like to show. And what about his past being revoked? Oh, it was trivial. So it's like switching off I... a child's Nintendo ten minutes early. And the honours list row continued, with Nadine Doris refusing to resign her seat until someone told her why she didn't get her peerage. But following the publication of the report, there were calls for Boris's entire list to be revoked. This is Chris Bryant, who chairs the Privileges Committee. The resignation honours list is a list of some of the most discredited people in Britain today. They're the people who enabled all of this in Downing Street. They're the people who cheered him on and they shouldn't be going to the House of Lords with a job for life. With the Partygate vote due to take place, it wasn't really surprising that a new video of a Partygate party at Tory HQ appeared over that weekend. As long as we don't <laughs> The BBC let noted historian Simon Sharma put the video and the Tory pandemic partying in context. It seemed to be so feckless, so irresponsible and a completely amoral delivery of let the little people suffer. Just pour another glass of Bulgarian Burgundy and have done with it. Boris's former advisor Samuel Kasumu was asked about his ex-boss's legacy and he may well have come up with something we can all agree on. Boris Johnson's legacy is of course the vaccine deployment but it's also some of the nonsense that happened. But it's completely possible to achieve great things and still be a bit of a knob. When the vote came up in the Commons, many Tory MPs failed to show up including Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. After several hours of debate the motion was passed but the numbers told their own story. Bear in mind that there are six 650 MPs in the House of Commons. The eyes to the right, 354. The nose to the left, seven. seven. Shadow leader of the House, Labour's Thangam Debonair, wasn't pulling any punches and she reminded the House of the hardship the nation went through during the pandemic. He was, as the committee said, the most prominent public promoter of those rules. So it is simply not credible for Johnson to repeatedly claim that they were complied with. This isn't just the reasonable person test, it's the who on earth do you think you are kidding test. And he fails both. The failure of many Tory MPs to turn up for the vote was no surprise, given that Rishi didn't even bother himself in what was seen as a sign of weak leadership and a failure to finally close the door on former PM Johnson. Officially, he was meeting the Swedish Prime Minister, but he made it quite clear earlier on Monday that he wasn't going to face the music. This is a matter for the House rather than for the government. It's an important distinction, and that's why I wouldn't want to influence anyone in advance of that vote. Ukrainian President Zelensky has spent a lot of time on the road in 2023, seeking to build support and gather more aid and weapons as the war in Ukraine continued. In May, he spent a week clocking up the air miles, starting with a trip to the Pope in Rome on a Saturday, then Germany and France. While in Germany, he picked up a new aid package worth £2.7 billion and expressed his thanks to German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. He said the priority is to clear Russia out of Ukraine. We will not attack Russian territory. We are preparing a counter-offensive to occupy the illegitimately conquered territories within the framework of our legitimate borders, which are recognised worldwide. Next up on the tour was the UK, and Rishi Sunak had a bit of a fanboy moment when he greeted him at Chequers. You are actually the first foreign leader that I've had the privilege of welcoming here as Prime Minister. Your leadership... Your country's bravery and fortitude are an inspiration to us all. I look forward to us discussing what more we can do to support you and your country. During their two-hour meeting, Rishi pledged to send hundreds more air defence missiles and armed drones to Ukraine to help them prepare for their highly anticipated counter-offensive. Zelensky says he's thankful for the support. You are with us, together with us, all Great Britain, you and your government. As it's very important, so thank you very much for all support. Sunak's meeting with Zelensky comes a week after the UK supplied Ukraine with multiple long-range storm shadow cruise missiles that infuriated Russia. Former Ukraine President Petro Poroshenko said they've already been put to good use. What they are doing is unconscionable and we have to start the process of holding them accountable and have them 
the uh, call to the Met to pay for the damages that they have caused. Also in May, the Black Sea grain deal, which sees Russia providing safe passage for Ukrainian grain, was renewed for another two months. And a Council of Europe meeting in Iceland agreed to set up a register of damages to track Russia's damages. And US ambassador to the UN, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, said it's an important step. What we can say without doubt is Russia has the intent and the capability to target the West's critical national infrastructure. We have to have the intent and the capability to defend it. Way back in April 2022, Boris's government announced a grand plan to send asylum seekers on a one-way trip to Rwanda so they could apply for asylum there. It seemed like a crazy scheme and sure enough, the first flight, which was due to take place last June, never took off after a multitude of legal challenges. The end of June saw the appeals court weigh in on the matter as the three-judge panel ruled that the long-distance scheme was in fact not permitted. Lord Chief Justice Burnett made the announcement. The result is that the High Court's decision that Rwanda was a safe third country is reversed and that unless and until the deficiencies in its asylum processes are corrected, removal of asylum seekers to Rwanda will be unlawful. It capped off a bad week for Home Secretary Suella Bravman, who found the cost per asylum seeker for the scheme was going to be £169,000. That was according to an impact assessment and would be on top of the £140 million already paid to Rwanda. But Suella's vowed to carry on with her struggle to stop the small boats. Whilst, of course, we are disappointed with the decision today, we will be putting in an application to seek permission to appeal very, very swiftly. Labour leader Sakir Starmer said he had a plan that involves actually processing asylum claims. The government's got no plan. It's got a gimmick, which is the Rwanda scheme, a gimmick which has already cost the taxpayer £140 million. And now we know from the court judgment this morning that the government didn't even do the basics to make sure that it was fit for purpose. Still to come on the standout seven, it's chaos at this morning and bad news for the Titan submersible. Right after this. Tired of ads barging into your favorite news podcasts? Good news. Ad-free listening on Amazon Music is included with your Prime membership. Just head to amazon.com slash ad-free news podcasts to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Enjoy thousands of ACAST shows ad-free for Prime subscribers. Some shows may have ads. Welcome back. ITV's flagship daytime show this morning was firmly in the spotlight in May as longtime presenter Philip Schofield quit after admitting to a secret affair with a male colleague while married. He described the affair as unwise but not illegal, but it sparked a huge row with former colleagues, including Holly Willoughby, on Instagram. She said Phil had lied to her about the affair. Then Phil called out people with a grudge against him while praising the crew on the ITV show. Eamon Holmes was also busy ranting about him on Twitter, and he sat down with Dan Wharton on GB News to dish the dirt on the whole affair. It made things very awkward on the actual show, where Dermot O'Leary and Alison Hammond were struggling on. We happen to be in the news at the moment, and of course we appreciate that. But just from both of us and the whole team here, the crew, the guys downstairs, we love making this show for all of you. Yeah, we really do. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to continue to do that. So let's go on with our first news story. Then Schofield broke his silence with an exclusive interview in The Sun, where he said he was not a groomer and apologised to the young man at the centre of the scandal. He also said the relationship began when the runner on this morning was 20. I am deeply sorry. And I apologise to him because I should have known better. His media appearances came as ITV instructed a barrister to carry out an external review of events at the channel. Phil told of his regret over lying to Holly about the affair. Yeah. The last time we had a conversation was when I texted, this is after the statement last week, don't reply, you're probably not allowed to, but I am deeply, deeply sorry that I lied to you. He also did an interview with the BBC's Amol Rajan and he spoke about the toll it's all taken on his mental health. I understand how Caroline Flack felt. Um, last week, if my daughters hadn't been there, then I wouldn't be here. Then on the 5th of June, Holly returned to the show with a somewhat tense opening message and another apology just for you. You, me and all of us at This Morning gave our love and support to someone who was not telling the truth who acted in a way that they themselves felt that they had to resign from ITV and step down from a career that they loved. That is a lot to process. 
By Tuesday, the focus had switched from the hosts to the bosses. They were hauled before the Culture Committee to answer questions about the scandal. And after Holly's cuddly opener, SNP MP John Nicholson couldn't resist a quick dig. I suppose I should ask, first of all, are you OK? He went on to condemn this morning editor Martin Frizzle's outrageously dismissive and flippant comments over whether there's a toxic work environment on the show. ITV Director of Policy Magnus Brook was forced to defend the company, saying they take their responsibilities of safeguarding very seriously. We do take uh, all of these allegations very seriously, precisely because we do have a culture uh, 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 in which people's conduct it matters enormously. June saw underwater drama as a tourist submarine with five people on board went missing on an expedition to the Titanic. The mini-sub lost contact with the surface an hour and 45 minutes into its dive on a Sunday morning and it triggered a frantic search involving the US Coast Guard. For four days, the world waited for a miracle, but it wasn't to be. Thursday saw confirmation that all five occupants of the missing Titan submersible were dead after debris belonging to the craft was found on the ocean floor. The four-day search of the Atlantic spanned an area of more than 10,000 square miles, but the wreckage discovery revealed the submersible likely imploded during its descent, killing everyone on board instantly. Rear Admiral John Morgan from the US Coast Guard made the announcement at a press conference. The debris is consistent with the catastrophic loss of the pressure chamber. On behalf of the United States Coast Guard and the entire Unified Command, I offer my deepest condolences to the families. Early in May saw Liverpool at the centre of Eurovision, Europe's biggest song contest, which ended with Sweden winning. So they'll host 2024 ceremony on the 50th anniversary of ABBA's win. <laughs> Liverpool stepped up on behalf of war-torn Ukraine, which won in 2022, and the event was truly spectacular with a choir of former winners performing You'll Never Walk Alone and a guest appearance from the Princess of Wales on piano. Sweden's Loreen becomes only the second person to win Eurovision for a second time. This is overwhelming. I'm so happy and I'm so thankful. Thank you for this. This is for you. Even hosting the Eurovision Song Contest this year couldn't improve the UK's chances, with most countries awarding the United Kingdom nil point. It meant Britain's May Muller came just 25th overall. That's one from the bottom, in case you're wondering. It's been such a huge honour to see like just as many Ukrainian flags in the streets as British flags, it just fills me with so much joy and I think this is what Eurovision is about. You've been listening to The Smart 7. We'll be back tomorrow at 7am. Hit that follow button and have a great day. Give us seven minutes and we'll give you the world. Tired of ads barging into your favourite news podcasts? Good news. Ad-free listening on Amazon Music is included with your Prime membership. Just head to amazon.com slash ad free news podcast to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Enjoy thousands of ACAST shows ad free for Prime subscribers. Some shows may have ads.